Welcome to the Taskers of Sri Lanka webinar. This is the second public webinar that we, the Wildlife Society of St. Thomas's College, Mount Lavinia, will be conducting. These webinars will be centered around topics related to flora and fauna, conservation and wildlife photography. The goal of these online webinars are to raise awareness among the public about Sri Lanka's wildlife, as we believe that awareness is a vital key to conservation. So, through these webinars, we hope to bring you expert knowledge and insight on Sri Lanka's wildlife, therefore helping you to build your interest and further your knowledge on your flora and fauna. So, firstly, I would like to just talk about a little bit of our society. Our wildlife society is one of the oldest, if not, one, if not the oldest, and longest surviving natural history societies in Sri Lanka. We were founded in 1884, which means that we were we would be celebrating our 136th anniversary this year. A great amount of scientists and biologists have been members of our society. Historical figures such as Lynn D. Alvis and P. E. P. Daraniagala, who were iconic two figures in this field, were past members of this valuable society. If any of you have a question related to the lecture, please go over to the chat and send the host, Jonathan, your questions. The chat has been modified so that your questions will only be delivered to one of the hosts, Tanushika or Jonathan. Please select Jonathan as the chat, uh, as the person who you direct the chat to. Now I would like to introduce the speaker for today's lecture, Mr. Rajiv Valikala. He is one of Sri Lanka's leading wildlife photographers. Mr. Rajiv Valikala, who is an old Thomian, is also part of is who was rather he he's also past member of the society and he was a past president he's one of sri lanka's leading wildlife tour operators organizing guided nature tours in sri lanka and around the world mr valikala is also a travel writer and for magazines and newspapers on sri lanka's wildlife and has also published a coffee table book titled children of eden a tribute to, tribute to sri lankan wildlife He's also a documentary fixer with experience uh, in handling leading productions for BBC and CBS in Sri Lanka. All this and so much more has he achieved. I don't think we have enough time to mention all of his accomplishments. So we are truly honored to have him to conduct this lecture. Without further ado, I would like to hand it over to Mr. Valikala. Thank you, Tanushika, uh, for the lovely introduction. Uh, it's actually uh, it's been an honor to you know be invited to speak uh, in this forum uh, as a past president of the society uh, i'd love to say that you know the wildlife society of st thomas's has uh, you know given me uh, the foundation and the, the start uh, for my passion and career in uh, wildlife uh, and wildlife photography conservation and tourism and uh, they were some of the best days of my life and uh, you know i cherish them uh, throughout my life and uh, i'm really really privileged to uh, and honored to have been invited to speak uh, in this forum so um, without further ado i think there are still a few more participants who keep coming in but uh, as we are set to start at 10 um, so I'll, the topic uh, i'll start today the topic of uh, Today's lecture is uh, about my personal passion uh, about the Tuskers of Sri Lanka. And uh, I would say they are the last of a noble line and, you know, we'll, we're soon, you know, losing the remaining Tuskers that we have. And this is more of uh, a, a topic to create uh, awareness uh, about their plight and a little bit more about uh, my passion uh, and also some of the notable tuskers that I have encountered throughout my travels uh, over the years in the country. So uh, I'll start with the basics. Uh, so the a, there are two main <clears throat> branches of elephant, the Asian elephant and the African elephant. Uh, the African elephant, I'll start with that, uh, have two species. Uh, uh, Earlier, you know, there was just a uh, run recognition of a species, but later on, uh, the forest elephant, the African forest elephant was uh, recognized as a separate species. Uh, they are distinctly different. Uh, the savanna elephant is what most people are familiar with. Uh, but the forest elephant, as you can see, the, the way the ivory shape, the ear shapes, 
and uh, uh, everything is a little different. They are found mainly uh, in the in the rainforests of the Congo as well as in West Africa. And uh, in Asia, uh, we have the main species which is the Asian elephant, which has uh, been divided to several subspecies. Uh, and uh, Sri the Sri Lankan elephant uh, has is its own distinctive subspecies. Uh, the scientific name is Elephas maximus maximus. And uh, we'll talk of the, as we are talk, talking about tuskers, um, we had to uh, uh, highlight the fact that in uh, ideal natural state, 95% of Asian elephant bulls should carry ivory. And this is uh, proven by research done by, by many uh, researchers and uh, quoted also as mentioned by uh, George Dan Balan uh, in a paper published this year. Uh, the clear rule in the natural world is for Asian bull elephants to have ivory. Sadly, there's a chronic issue in Sri Lanka uh, due to many reasons. Um, there are only 7% of the males have ivory. It's shocking because the rest of the uh, Asian countries, especially India, have much more higher percentage of tuskers, e uh, even despite the fact that we, you know, we've all had uh, terminus uh, history. Uh, the, uh, the Sri Lankan elephant elephants uh, are lacking tuskers uh, to a very high degree. So um, in India, the tuskless, the elephants without tusks are called maknas. Uh, in Sri Lanka, of course, you just call them alia. And in English, for the tusker, you call them atta. Uh, there are many reasons for uh, the lack of tuskers. Uh, there were theories. Uh, that you know, Sri Lanka never had tuskers, and the, you know the tuskers uh, were due to uh, elephants, uh, tame elephants, imported elephants escaping and breeding with the local herd. Uh, but the most uh, realistic and accurate uh, uh, theory is that you know it's due to mass hunting, uh, domestication, capture, and export of these tuskers throughout history. So the best of the all the best tuskers are all uh, you know have been captured or uh, killed. Uh, from the time of uh, from the time of the uh, you know the British the, and even before that the Dutch there was evidence that the Dutch exported ivory from Sri Lanka as well. So uh, this continuous interference by humans um, has resulted in uh, the dire situation right now, um, and also uh, uh, what you call uh, this. Uh, uh, the, inter the capture of these elephants, the best tuskers being captured for domestic use, for use in you know, domestic work, uh, has also affected it drastically, especially because uh, most of the tame tus the tuskers in uh, captivity are not bred. So it's a waste of a gene pool altogether. And uh, I have to say some of the most impressive tuskers uh, were caught from the wild. Uh, one of them is uh, the late Milangula Raja, which uh, is said to have another largest, if not the largest, tusks of any Asian elephant. He was caught in Anamadur, uh, which uh, you know is must have been part of the uh, we assume is part of the Dadurua herd, and uh, is one of the most impressive tuskers in Asia. Um, sadly, he was in captivity, and, um, and there, there's no record of him being uh, bred with uh, any females. So these genes are lost forever. Um, why are tusks important and why are they needed? So first thing is tusks uh, are used uh, as a symbol to attract the females. A tusker is more desirable for a female to mate with. And uh, it's like the antlers of a deer. The bigger the antlers, the more impressive they are for the females. And uh, same in the case of the tusks. Um, in uh, and also to deter competitors. So the bigger the tusks, the more impressive and intimidating they are. Um, they deter the competition as well. And uh, also uh, they use the tusks as weapons. And uh, uh, in most cases, uh, you uh, when there's a conflict between a tusker and elephant, uh, you have to uh, take that into a, a certain factors where uh, an elephant state of uh, must, so, uh, I will explain what must is uh, uh, in the next few slides. But basically, if the elephants are both in the state of must at the equal stage and are of equal size, uh, seven, the studies reveal that 78.6% of the time, the tusker will prevail over the elephant without tusks. 
And this is a study carried out in Kaziranga National Park uh, by Chellaya and Sukuma in a paper published in 2013. So the tuskers have a distinctive advantage over elephants without tusks. And uh, also, as I mentioned about must. So must is actually a, a periodic condition uh, that the bulls get into uh, every year uh, where they become highly aggressive. Their testosterone levels shoot up to 60 times the normal level. And during this time, they have a very competitive advantage over any elephant uh, who is not in must to uh, aggressively fight and what, you know, fight them off to win uh, the right to mate. So if there are competing bulls, if there's a bull with in must, uh, they have an advantage due to the high level of aggression uh, that they have. Uh, and they can be pretty dangerous during this time as well. And uh, what some of the features of a must bull which you can identify is um, their temporal uh, glands uh, are so swollen and uh, there's a secretion which comes out, uh, which keeps flowing out from the size of their face. And uh, this also emits a very strong smell. Um, and uh, you would easily identify a must bull uh, by this uh, smell and the, uh, the look of the glands uh, secreting continuously. Um, and also this is very painful for the elephant. This glands swell up. And what the studies have revealed is that the, you know, the, it presses on the eyes and the, you, they, they are always in pain. And that is another reason for the aggression. Uh, also, you can see continuously they will be dribbling urine as well during this time. So, uh, as I said, the uh, temporal glands uh, secreting. So, this is, these are two images of uh, two bulls, uh, uh, tuskers who are, who are in must. You can see from the side of their face, there's a glandular secretion. So, this is a good way to identify uh, an elephant in must. And uh, another uh, feature is like they... Uh, you, you do see uh, elephants digging the ground. Uh, and one of the main the, uh, theories uh, which is believed uh, they do, do that is to release the pressure from their glands uh, because they're in so much pain. Uh, to release pressure uh, from, the, from the glands, they press the tusks onto the ground. So this, uh, this is some, a common behavior you sometimes see uh, among tuskers. And also uh, you see uh, Tuskers, are mar they mark their trees, uh, mark trees, uh, they rub their faces, they sometimes uh, take a bit of the bark off from trees. So elephants don't necessarily have what you call territories, but rather home ranges, and they're pretty large and extensive. And uh, marking of trees is believed to be uh, uh, just marking their presence, just to, you know, uh, mark their presence and, uh, you know, their existence uh, in certain areas. And uh, another uh, fact uh, about tuskers is uh, tuskers usually can be right tusked or left tusk. Uh, they tend to use one tusk more than the other. And uh, a good way to uh, identify uh, which is the master tusk, which is the tusk which they use more often is to see which one is more worn out. Uh, in this instance, uh, you can see uh, this tusk is you know, broken at the edge, it's more worn out. Uh, in this also, you can see this is more rounded and worn out. So they tend, to, when they're digging uh, uh, and, you know, using the tusks, uh, uh, they, they prefer to use one side, like a human would use the right hand or the left hand. Um, another purpose is to dig bark off the trees, sometimes which they do eat. And also uh, in certain areas with minerals and salts, they use the tusks to dig the earth uh, to get these minerals out. Another interesting feature is, uh, which shows the master tusk uh, is what uh, is called um, a grass notch. So a grass notch is, uh, as you can see in this tusk, this is the tusk in Nalaka, uh, in Yala. Um, there's a small notch on the edge of the tusk. So some of these tuskers do have this grass notch, uh, which they believe is because they manipulate the grass uh, and digging them out, uh, it causes this groove on the tusk. So these are just a few um, fun facts about tuskers. Uh, and also um, what we notice is uh, the tusks are also used to, uh, the rest, uh, to rest the trunk, where the trunk can be quite heavy as well. And uh, as you see in this photograph, so uh, tuskers do, uh, if, you, if 
you do observe them and their behavior, this is a very relaxed pose. Uh, it shows that the elephant is pretty relaxed uh, and resting the trunk on the tusk uh, shows that it's, a re it's relaxed at that moment uh, and quite at ease. Um, another uh, thing we want, I want to highlight is uh, the difference between tusks and tushers. Now, uh, smaller elephants, uh, like the young ones, when they, when they are growing, they're smaller tuskers, uh, these are actually tusks, and uh, you you mistake them for uh, what they call tushers or panudat in Sinhala. Uh, these will grow on to become ivory, but uh, in most adults, they have small protrusions, uh, which are called tushers. Uh, females have them as well, and uh, these are not tusk tusk it's, uh, itself, but they are very small uh, uh, your protrusions, which uh, are sometimes are not visible even to uh, the outside unless they open the mouth. So even the females and males have these protrusions, uh, which they call tushers. They are not tusks and they are not tuskers. They are, you know, uh, they, they don't grow. Uh, ivory, on the other hand, uh, grows uh, throughout their life. And uh, the records have stated that elephants uh, do uh, have an acceleration of growth in their tusk length and thickness uh, after 30 years of age. So sometimes you might uh, notice a pretty average looking tusker having massive tusks uh, after 30 years of age as they mature and uh, it grows quite significantly. So historically uh, elephants and tuskers have been quite significant in Sri Lankan culture. Uh, if you go to any historic site like Anuradhapura, uh, namely, you would see so many murals, uh, rock carvings, and uh, depictions of tuskers. So uh, it goes back to the state that tuskers were highly valued uh, in, from ancient times. And this also uh, resulted in, uh, could have resulted in uh, the decline in the numbers in the wild populations. And of course, uh, as the colonials arrived, mass uh, huntings were uh, happening uh, on a regular basis. And uh, they were decimated. Most of the tuskers uh, were decimated along with all the elephants as well. And uh, they were considered vermin during uh, the times of the British Raj. And uh, there were rec records of shocking number of elephants which were killed. Uh, one of the most well noted is uh, Sir Samuel Baker, uh, said uh, to have killed 11 elephants before breakfast one morning, and within three days have killed uh, 104 elephants. And uh, also people like Major Skinner and Captain Galway uh, have each killed 700 elephants each. But the record and most shocking number of elephants was killed by someone called Major Rogers. Uh, shockingly, he has killed 1,300 elephants within a span of three years. Uh, so these these are you know some of the many you know shocking numbers of uh, elephants killed. So obviously the the target the main target would be a trophy uh, elephant. A tro elephant for a good trophy would be a tusker. So they would be first targeted um, in any herd. So unfortunately, this is uh, the reality and what really happened to Sri Lanka's tuskers. Um, and then. Um, Moving on to some of the common myths and misconceptions about tuskers in Sri Lanka. These are some of uh, the beliefs and uh, uh, stories uh, you hear in the villages, uh, which are you know uh, not true at all. But of course, uh, these are beliefs. Uh, one is if when tracking tuskers, uh, the villagers believe that the tuskers have a different footprint uh, shape to uh, a normal bull or a normal elephant, and they they believe that the tusk uh, tuskers' foot is more oval which is not true, they are all from the same species, so footprints don't differ. Another, uh, another misconception is uh, on the words, uh, the, sing the words in Sinhalese, uh, where people say, okay, Atta is the tasker, and then they have another word called Atinni, and then they have another word for uh, the female, apparently without tusk, which is Kenara, which, but the reality is the Asian elephant, the females don't have tusk. Uh, there was there have been like one freak occurrence in uh, I think India uh, where a female had produced ivory, but those are like you know very uh, unusual uh, mutations and uh, freak occurrences. But generally, females never have tusk in uh, the Sri Lankan uh, sorry in the Asian elephant. 
uh, and thus uh, Athene, the word Athene is actually irrelevant. Uh, on, unless people are referring to Athene for a female with tasks, but you know, as I said, they are not tasks. Uh, another uh, word people use in uh, in the wilds is about the word Pumpatrana, and the belief is that it's the father, mother, and baby. But you know, uh, in the elephant social structures, uh, the females stick together uh, along with the young ones, and the matured bulls only uh, join the herds when they're in mass. Uh, when they're looking for potential mates and looking for females and estrus who are in season to mate with. Uh, so there's no scenario where uh, you actually find uh, the, the male, the female and the baby, you know, living together or moving around together uh, and unless the male is hanging around with uh, a herd. Um, and there's another belief that uh, if you collect the mud that the tasker use, uh, uses, uh, uh, to dig when it's digging uh, the ground uh, to use them for the foundation of someone's home um, or even use it uh, to get uh, you know, a small part to keep in a wallet uh, because in uh, the local belief is that uh, you accumulate wealth uh, if you can keep this mud or clay uh, so this is these are just local myths and legends um, uh, about tuskers and another famous uh, topic people talk about is about Gajamutu. So Gajamutu or elephant pearls. So uh, people think that all tuskers have pearls in their tusks, which is a, you know, it's far from the truth. So what really happens is that uh, there is a, a cavity at the base of the tusk, uh, which is usually filled with nerves and blood vessels and uh, a, a gel of sorts. Uh, but as the, as the, uh, Task, as the task becomes older, uh, you know this gel, this gel diminishes, and there's a hollow uh, hollow area uh, at the base of the tusk. And what usually can happen is that uh, a small piece of the dentine of the in the wall of the cavity uh, can fall in into this uh, into this cavity. And uh, as the tusk keeps shaking and moving around, this piece of dentine can get polished and uh, it becomes like almost like a pearl. So this is what is referred to as gajamutu, and they are very small, uh, small you know pieces and uh, things. And uh, what sometimes in in television you you see the police capturing uh, big uh, things called gajamutu, but you know some of them are either counterfeit or they are not uh, the real thing. The real gajamutu is quite small, and uh, they're, they're, so this is uh, the real you know. Uh, story behind the elephant pearls and sadly uh, this is one of the reasons which why taskers are targeted uh, besides the ivory uh, because they they claim people have put a value to this and claim that this is uh, uh, you know a priceless artifact <clears throat> and uh, so moving to the main issue at hand so the threats there are many threats to taskers in sri lanka there's only very few remaining and uh, the, the main th threat would be poaching because people are greedy by nature. And unfortunately, uh, you know, we would admire the Tusker and, you know, look at his beauty and majesty, but most people just see the rupee sign or the dollar sign, you know, think that, okay, this is a good way, make a quick buck. So that is the reason why, uh, uh, as I go through the, some of the Tuskers I've encountered, uh, most of them, uh, who are still existing in certain areas, I would not mention the, the place itself uh, because we need to be careful uh, because uh, information does pass around and uh, we are always worried for the safety of our taskers. Uh, another issue uh, which was a hot topic several years ago was uh, the smuggling of young taskers from the wild. So there was, there was said to be a record where young taskers were you know, snatch from the wild and, uh, you know, suddenly appeared in somebody's home. So this uh, is very controversial and very political, so I don't want to go very deep into it, but um, there was an issue like this and I, there may be, a, it, that issue may be still running around. So for any in remaining taskers, like you, you know, the, as I said, there's only 7% uh, of males in Sri Lanka having tasks and if that's being taken out as well, uh, we are looking at losing uh, the taskers very soon.
uh, the way this is going. But uh, one of the most pressing issues, I would say the most pressing issue right now, more than anything else for elephants and tuskers in common is habitat loss. Uh, it's constantly happening with every, uh, every year, we are losing more and more habitat. Uh, we have around 6,000 or more ele wild elephants in the country. And uh, shockingly to most people, they are not restricted to national parks. More, there are more elephants outside national parks uh, than in them. Uh, thing is, elef uh, the common misconception is that elephants need, uh, you know, dense forest to stay. It's, you know, elephants need disturbed forest and disturbed habitats with grasslands, shrubland, and open areas which are they use, they, which they, eat, you know, feed on, uh, not just big trees. So uh, it's very important to maintain the grasslands and the open plains and areas like that. Uh, and that is the reason why abandoned chena cultivations, uh, you know, during off seasons are very highly sought after by elephants. They feed on the, the grass and the, the plants in these uh, areas. So the problem now is they're losing most of these habitats. They are, uh, especially uh, ones which are used for commercial purposes uh, like mango plantations, sugar, pa sugar cane, you know, and large areas of habitat are being lost. Uh, through my travels, I've seen it shocking some areas where uh, there's said to be about 250 to 300 elephants in the area and all, all you see is human habitat as hardly anything left. So when it comes to, uh, when that happens, the elephants naturally get into a conflict with the local farmers and the people uh, and the people retaliate uh, in many ways. Uh, one of the uh, main ways we have seen, uh, you know, elephants being uh, damaged and uh, killed. Uh, one of them is setting trap guns. The trap guns may not necessarily be for the elephant. It may be targeted towards wild boar, but elephants unfortunately fall victim to this. And I've seen many uh, who have infected legs uh, and feet uh, due to this uh, device. And people do also take shots at the elephants uh, and you see most most of them with, you know, uh, small wounds all over the, uh, you know, body, uh, which are festering uh, due to that. Uh, another terrible uh, device is hakapatas, especially for young elephants. Uh, these are explosives uh, planted in certain vegetables, uh, mainly targeting uh, wild boar, uh, who, which they, uh, people consume. But of course, elephants do fall victim to this. Poison is another, another uh, you know, method. And uh, another big danger for elephants is the unregulated electric fences, not the fences that are uh, used uh, to, you know, deter them, but some people tend to use uh, the main electric line uh, to make do fences, which is deadly not only for elephants, but also for people. Uh, so there are cases of elephants, like, you know, sometimes three to five in one, one group, just dropping dead uh, after being electrocuted because the power has been drawn from the main line, which is technically illegal. Uh, another issue for uh, elephants in general uh, is falling into large unprotected agricultural wells. So these agricultural wells are massive and uh, they don't have walls as such. So an un unsuspecting elephant can easily fall into these. And uh, if, they, if uh, undiscovered, they can easily drown and die. Uh, another pressing issue uh, in the recent years uh, is the collision with trains. And uh, this is also a major problem which uh, we are foreseeing that you know, there are many elephants being killed. On average, about 350 elephants are killed every year in Sri Lanka. And um, it's rising continuously. So it's quite a, a dire situation uh, for tuskers as well as elephants in the country. And the rate this is going, I'm sad to say that we might be losing, uh, you know, the treasures that we have. Uh, ideally, what should be done, um, especially for the tuskers, especially the significant tuskers, because we don't have much. It's not like you know, uh, it's uh, there are you know a lot of tuskers. We don't have much. At least uh, find a way to give permanent protection to these. And you know, uh, what happens in Kenya, uh, for example, is that they you know some significant tuskers are called national treasures, national monuments, and given army protection. So these are the kind of things that we you know, should do to preserve uh, at least some of the significant big bulls who are left. 
uh, at least so that they can pass their genes and uh, <clears throat> genetics to the next generation. So that being said, with uh, you know all the problems that um, we are uh, the taskers are facing, uh, I would like to go to the next section uh, where I go through some of the notable taskers that I've encountered from my childhood uh, up to uh, the modern day. Uh, starting with Kublai Khan, uh, this is uh, a, yeah, this was taken photograph. This is actually the first Tusker photograph I would say I have taken. Uh, I took this photograph in year 2000. I was 15 years old, and uh, it was on one of the wildlife society trips uh, we did to Yala. And uh, while you we were camping, uh, he was right next to the road and uh, using my small uh, film camera, uh, the basic uh, Yashika camera. I managed to take this photograph. So Kublai Khan was uh, quite a well-known figure in Yala uh, during that uh, era uh, up to, uh, I would say, I think he died in uh, between like uh, 2008, 2009, during that time, I would say. Um, and uh, he was quite a well-known uh, and one of the most commonly known uh, seen elephants in the park. Next, this is uh, Vasanta. Uh, I we named him Vasanta because uh, after the memory of the late park warden of Vilpattu, uh, Mr. Vasanta Pushmananda, who was sadly uh, killed by the LTTE. Uh, so Vasanta uh, was also for, uh, photographed while I was in school. Uh, this was the first trip uh, we did to Vilpattu uh, with the Wildlife Society in 2003. And uh, I had come out of the park along with our master in charge, Mr. Pedma Fernando, meet Mr. Vasanta Pushpananda and uh, uh, for discussing the project. And while moving uh, back in on Percy Bendy Weber, we encountered this beautiful tusker. And, uh, and we, we didn't expect to see anything during this tour because just, it was just after the park has opened, uh, after being closed for so many years. So there was hardly any, any wildlife to be seen. And this was the first thing we saw, and it was amazing and something I would never forget. So after so many years, uh, from after seeing them, him in 2003, uh, I saw him again in 2014, 11 years later. Uh, we uh, heard news that there was a tusker roaming around outside the parks. Um, and uh, there are a few photographs floating around, so I really want to go and see uh, who it was. and. Uh, after many, many days of trying, uh, we were finally rewarded by uh, coming face to face with uh, my old friend. Um, I we believe that um, we believe that he was uh, blind in one eye, as you can see the the eyes are a bit milky, uh, and uh, he didn't have much uh, eyesight during that time. Sadly, uh, yeah, he was walking around. He walked past this uh, small watch hut. And uh, it was um, it was uh, uh, a really really nice sight to uh, encounter Vasanta once again after eleven years. But it was sorry it was short lived uh, because a uh, few months later we got news that a uh, pair of ivory was caught by the police. And uh, as the poacher uh, took them, you know where they found the body, it seems that the this poor tusker. Uh, succumb to the greed of a poacher. Uh, so, as I said, the po these are all constant. You know, they are constantly in danger of uh, uh, being poached, and uh, hence uh, they are always at risk. And people always uh, look at the monetary value, but in most cases, these tasks are almost always uh, caught by the police. So you never end up getting what you want. So it's just a waste of a life because you, you don't have, you lose the elephant and the poacher doesn't get the tusk either. So it's such a shame and a waste of a life uh, and a, you know, a treasure actually uh, to be poaching such a beautiful animal. So that's the end of uh, Vasanta and moving on to another tragic story. This is one of the most tragic stories um, that I have come across uh, in wildlife uh, in my lifetime. This is the story of Parakrama. He uh, by far would have had the largest pair of tusks in Sri Lanka. He was a very impressive elephant. Unfortunately, uh, he was roaming around uh, in an area which didn't have a national park, didn't have a forest reserve. 
um, cover, surrounded by humans, surrounded by farmland. And for some crazy reason, there was an order given to relocate him overnight. And um, they just, they caught him uh, right next to, they, they tranquilized him and they caught him and tied him up. And they were hoping to relocate him to somewhere else. Um, and the tragic story is that, you know, when, you, when I went to see him, uh, you know, it's such a shame to see such a majestic Tusker who was kept against its will uh, and about to be taken to a strange land. And thing is, relocations uh, from the uh, times they have all done uh, for so many Tuskers uh, throughout the years in Sri Lanka, especially for the bulls, it almost 99% of the time, it doesn't work. Either uh, the elephant would come back to its old habitat or it would create chaos in that area that it's been relocated or would die in the process. And this is such a sad photograph that, you know, moment where I saw the Tusker digging the ground and un unwilling to, uh, to be uh, dragged into the truck. And uh, rightly so, because that night we got terrible news that was a Parakrama died along the way. Uh, one of the legs had got caught uh, to a gap in the uh, a piece of plank has broken uh, on the on the truck, and his leg he had tripped and you know he was kneeling down, uh, and they couldn't get him up, uh, maybe due to extra sedatives which are given and the weight of his body uh, basically uh, pressed against his lungs and heart and uh, he died. So end of the day, we lost a national treasure for life. Uh, we did just, just screwed up and uh, we lost this uh, national treasure, uh, which was such a beautiful animal. And if, uh, if not the most beautiful tusker in Sri Lanka. So within a day, uh, with careless actions, uh, we lost some uh, national treasure. So it's a very tragic story. Uh, then moving on to another Tusker, which uh, who I'm very uh, fond of. Uh, sadly, he's no, we presume he's no more. This is Walagamba. Uh, he was he's one of the biggest, tallest Tuskers I've ever seen. Like physically, one of the biggest Tuskers. A uh, massive bull uh, seen uh, quite often in the north central province uh, comes on to a certain lake and uh, he uh, comes during the time he's in must. So, as you can see, he's in must. Uh, he, has very sh he has short tusks, but these were uh, you know, quite efficient in warding off uh, other males. And because he's the physically the biggest tusker, he, uh, he always was the most dominant in that herd. As you can see, the size difference. This is a young calf, but you know, just see how looming this giant is. So one of the tallest tuskers uh, I have ever encountered. Uh, this is him next to a fully grown female. You can clearly see the size difference. So this is a very impressive animal. Sadly, he was not seen since 2011. Uh, and has not shown up ever since. And uh, we presume that he would have died because he comes in during a certain season and moves out. So we don't know where he's hanging around during uh, the rest of the year. And um, sadly, we, we presume that he's no more. Uh, this is another favorite in the same herd where Valagamba is. Uh, this uh, tasker is known as Digadantu number two. So there is a Digadantu number one as well. Uh, but like your know, Digadantu two is uh, actually quite a lovely specimen. Uh, in this uh, photograph, he was actually charging me uh, head on. Uh, it was a mock charge and uh, you know, he was quite young during the time. And uh, one of his, he had managed to break a little bit uh, of his task. As I mentioned, uh, him being uh, this, uh, he's a uh, left task elephant basically. So he has chipped off this part because he's using it more often than the right side. And uh, there's also another instance during that same, same year. And uh, he uses the tusk to dig up grass and things like that. And uh, this was a, a scenario where a villager had entered the lake uh, where he was hanging around. He was utterly annoyed with this and uh, he decided to chase them away. 
so this is where he photographed uh, the village running away um, and uh, a year later i saw him uh, he had broken most of his tusk and he had uh, also uh, it's not clear on this photograph but he has torn a uh, big part of his ear uh, as well and uh, this was taken in 2016 so you can see how the ivory has become thicker over the time uh, you know as they mature the ivory does become thicker and he's a, he was a very impressive bull uh, unfortunately there was a body found uh, in, in the lake uh, last year and uh, from what it seems we presume that uh, it's the gadanta too who has died uh, we feel that it has died of natural causes, maybe attacked by another tusker. Uh, so it's a natural, uh, you know, state that sometimes they do fight and, you know, there can be fatalities. So I think Bigadan too, too is no more with us because this year we did not see him. So this is another uh, very young tusker which uh, I first encountered. Uh, uh, into you know many years ago and he has grown to be a fine bull a fine young bull uh, his name is Neela and uh, he has beautiful upward curving tusks um, and uh, he he's not very tall but a very stocky elephant and uh, one of the uh, key features which I have noticed and I uh, you know very which are very impressive about him he has very uh, he has a very significant dome on his head so the Asian elephants have two domes, uh, which are a significant feature. And uh, the reason for this one is the skull is also shaped as two domes, but also a lot of the neck muscles are, you know, ending up in the dome. So there's a lot of muscles on the top of the head. And most bull elephants, when they want to intimidate or when they're alarmed, they raise their head. And when they raise the head, you can see the dome is significantly bigger. So uh, this is almost like uh, the fact when uh, someone is flexing their muscles. So this is uh, what it looks like. And the bigger the dome, the more impressive the elephant is. And the very mature bulls, uh, as they pass 30 years of age, have very large domes. Uh, and this is a way to impress uh, uh, what you call uh, impress uh, the females and also to intimidate others. So the big tusks and the big domes uh, are the uh, are the significant uh, features of a healthy, successful bull. And um, then uh, moving on. So another big bull in the same area where Neela, Valagamba, and Digadanthu were roaming around in the north central province is this guy. His name is Revata. Uh, right now he is the the biggest uh, tasker, physically the biggest tasker uh, in in the in this area. And uh, usually when he's around, he's the boss. Uh, he's quite big, uh, big and stocky. Uh, has relatively short tusks. Uh, he's not as tall as Valagamba, but uh, he's somewhat around that uh, close to that height uh, quite a big elephant big head and uh, you know big body as well so he's seen almost every year and uh, you know uh, he's quite dominant as well and uh, uh, and let's move on yeah so another beautiful bull in the same region uh, is barana uh, Barana usually comes into must and comes into the herd at the same time that Revata moves out. Uh, I personally have not seen them together. May, maybe certain years they would have been roaming together. So Barana is, uh, I would say, the second biggest and most impressive tusker in uh, in this location uh, at the moment. And uh, one of the reason, uh, ways to identify is he has this funny mark on his forehead and uh, this mark is one of the easiest ways to identify barna he has uh, some very nice looking tusks and he's quite a big bull as well uh, very impressive you see he's in full must you see the temporal glands uh, you know secreting and also you see continuous dribble of urine as well and uh, the beautiful tusker so he's still alive you saw him this year as well 
So thankfully he is still with us, and so is Revata and Neela. But we don't know for how long. This is another old friend of mine. Uh, I like to call him One Task John because he's a single tasker. Uh, there's, they also call him Unicorn. Uh, uh, he's seen in Minneria National Park. And uh, this was also taken from an old film camera of mine. Uh, 2000, in 2009, uh, we went in search of him. And after exploring the whole lake uh, for you know the whole evening, uh, just as we were about to give up, we came across him all alone um, and uh, just, uh, you know, uh, hanging around on his own. And he started walking towards us, gave us a mock charge and then just slowly moved away and started grazing. So single taskers are also, uh, according to as you can see, uh, there's no, it's not like he has broken this task. There's, there seems to be nothing at the base. Uh, so you can, uh, single taskers can either be born without one task uh, or um, through different types of stress. It can be uh, fighting with another elephant or uh, if they try to, uh, you know, yank it out or do something, uh, they can, you know, uh, break it off uh, as well. So, uh, you know, there are several reasons for, for it, but mainly they can, they're born without uh, a particular task. So this was uh, taken a few years later, and he comes to uh, when he's in Mast. And uh, another beautiful scenery where he's walking around uh, looking for females. So when they're in Mast, they keep walking around, circling around. They, they, they don't stay in one place, you know, and uh, when the bulls are in Mast, they are always moving around. Uh, another impressive bull found in Min area is uh, this boy. This guy is uh, known as Wasaba, and uh, he's uh, he's one of the most dominant bulls there. And when he's around, uh, very few very few uh, tuskers do challenge him, and uh, most of the big boys move out when he's around. And uh, he's pretty dominant as well. So, uh, and he moves between Min area and Kaudul. One of my favorites in this area is uh, known as Mahasen uh, right now and uh, also known as the Soma Vatiya Tasker. Uh, very impressive bull. I would say right now from the known Tuskers, he has the biggest pair of ivory uh, out there. Uh, he was uh, an enigma for so many people for many years because we, uh, the legend, uh, this legendary Tusker was set to appear all of a sudden and disappear all of a sudden in a in Kaudulla and uh, for many years I tried to see him with so many failed attempts. Many other photographers tried as well. Uh, but you know he did come after a while uh, after years of persistence I did I was fortunate to see him uh, three times and uh, he's a very very impressive bull. As you see his ivory is crossing at the end and uh, uh, he's not very tall but he's very stocky and well built. And uh, and we want yeah this is another uh, close up. So the the first encounter I had with uh, Mahasen was quite memorable. He uh, walked right up to our jeep and just stood there and looked from side to side from his uh, from his eyes. He just looked straight at us and he was in full mask as you see and just spent a few minutes just eyeing us out and then walked away towards the females. And so it was very impressive uh, sighting. And uh, as you see, with you know, there's some beautiful thick ivory. And uh, he's a very, very impressive bull and one of my favorites. So he does still uh, appear from time to time. Sadly, uh, you can see uh, people have had, uh, you know, peppered him with a few shots here and there. And uh, because he, he spends most of his time uh, in unsecured areas and, uh, un you know, besides the time that he's seen uh, in these lakes, uh, we really don't know what he's up to uh, when he's outside. They say he hangs around in Somavatiya National Park, but we really don't know where he's moving around. So, uh, and he's getting quite a, uh, quite on with the, uh, quite old with his age. Uh, and uh, the tuskers like Wasaba uh, now seem to be dominating and were chasing, like it was, uh, it appears that they are more dominant than this guy uh, who's normally seen in the fringes of the park uh, during a certain time. 
but he's nevertheless one of the most impressive impressive uh, bulls seen in sri lanka at the moment another young bull uh, who came who's coming up the ranks is sumedha a very impressive uh, guy he was uh, you know he had relatively decent ivory uh, several years ago but uh, recently he's showing a lot of promise and showing going to be a very you know good looking bull uh, seen again in min area and uh, how to that region the national parks and uh, quite an impressive specimen as well and uh, you know quite a treat to photograph him uh, when he comes into must then he's uh, uh, he's uh, hang around with the herds uh, this occasion of course he was alone in the morning just walking around the plains and i was fortunate enough to uh, catch a glimpse of him and then uh, moving to the south of sri lanka this is another elephant named sumedha uh, this is in udawalave national park uh, and he is one of the most impressive bulls uh, you find in udawalave uh, here he is in full must in the, and uh, also the, the easiest way to identify this sumedha the udawalave sumedha uh, is with this hole in his ear Uh, this is the easiest way to identify him and he's a pretty matured bull uh, and uh, quite quite an impressive specimen so i was very happy to have encountered him few times uh, as you know dolave is not an open plain so it's very not that easy to see uh, and spot uh, individual elephant so i was very fortunate to see him um talking about dolave uh, i'd like to highlight about this young guy this uh, tusker was known as mugalan he had a lot of potential to become a very impressive tusker as you see he's very you know even though he's young his ivory is quite long and uh, he had a lot of potential uh, but unfortunately he succumbed to uh, to the, the the evil works of man and uh, sadly he he was found shot dead uh, right outside like right on the border of the park he just so sad to see him just like almost seated life like uh as he was dead uh some some of the he had been raiding uh, some of the sugar cane on the other side uh, along with some elephants and uh, somebody just decided to take a shot at him it's such an unfortunate uh, situation to see a young potential great, great tusker lost permanently uh this is a task of very close to my heart and uh, uh someone who actually um, uh who who actually uh, i'm very i was very close to uh, he we call him the dalaputwa or the cross tasker uh found uh, in the area of uh, you know in the north uh, in the in the area of galgamur and uh, he was almost uh like the the unofficial mascot or like the you know the pet you know elephant in this region where he used to roam around uh, you know comes once in a while to uh, uh, some chenas and you know uh, just hangs around uh, he's very gentle he's most of the time he's uh, he's you know he's alone or he has few uh, young males uh, who guard him as well uh and uh, we believe that he is partially blind in one eye uh and uh, there be you know he's usually very gentle and you know we don't you don't have any issues with him but there are certain time where uh, one time where he'd been disoriented and he ended up all the way in kakirav and he was attacking uh, several vehicles which are passing by uh once the violet department realized that it was him uh, they had to escort him back to galgamur so this is a time where he cannot see very well as well also so this results in uh, him uh, being disoriented if he's away from his home turf so one reason where he would have ended up in that area would be that you know if people uh, would be chasing him using uh, firecrackers and uh, explosives and uh, if he in his panic he would have moved out of uh, familiar territory uh so when we saw him uh, when i saw him first time uh, in 2013 uh we got really close to him he was out in uh, in, a, in one of the chena cultivations and uh, close to a abandoned paddy paddy field and uh, as you see uh, his his tusks were touching the edges and that's why they call him a cross tusk he's a very very big bull 
you would have been about nine and a half to close to 10 feet in height. And uh, a few years later, we encountered and uh, actually an eyewitness told that he, uh, he tends to separate these tusks, maybe because uh, uh, these tusks seem to be pressing on this. Uh, it was creating some pressure and pain for him. Uh, one of my closest friends in this area uh, said that he's observed him like putting the tusk next to a tree and pulling it apart. So that is the reason. This, there's no uh, signs that it has got damaged or broken, but rather that it's just that gap is created. So here, what my uh, what a witness is that he has separated it on his own. Uh, in this uh, photograph, we actually were looking for him because he unfortunately uh, had got caught to a trap gun and this leg uh, had been se severely infected and swollen. Uh, also, as you see, there's a piece of skin falling off from the trunk as well. So he was heavily damaged and he and he was not doing too well. You see the, the spine was showing up and, you know, because usually he's a very hefty, hefty elephant because he, he eats a lot from the crops and uh, a lot of the cultivation. So he was quite a big made elephant. But uh, in this, uh, his, de his condition was deteriorating. You see, so many pot shots people have taken, you know, with the shotguns uh, and so many pellets all over his body. So it's such a sad situation. And uh, this was his leg during that time. Uh, it was swollen and uh, uh, it was quite, quite, quite a bad state. Um, sadly, uh, in 2017, uh, we got news, uh, very bad news. So this is actually a photograph taken in 2013 when I first saw him. He's so peaceful and he just was feeding quietly in the evening. And uh, we just, you know, walked walk close to him and just sat down and just observed his behavior. It's, he was such a gentle animal. Sadly, we, uh, the, there was a news alert that uh, a pair of ivory was caught uh, by the police. And when you traced it back, we found that uh, it was our friend, uh, the Dalaput. Uh, again, he has ventured to an area which was, he was not too familiar with. And somebody in that area just thought, okay, we can make a quick buck out of this. Uh, and they planned uh, to kill him. And uh, unfortunately, there are several forces behind it. Uh, and uh, they are the guys, the killers are out there. Uh, the court case is still pending due to certain legal reasons. And it's unfortunate that justice cannot be uh, met for uh, this poor soul. So another poor soul lost uh, in this conflict uh, between elephant and man. And a precious task are lost uh, to all of us. Um, this is a beautiful, uh, potentially uh, impressive tusker uh, known as Bullet. Uh, unfortunately, he's in a very dangerous situation right now. And I'm pretty, we are pretty worried because he tends to come towards the fence in Udawalave and beg for food. And people, like not everybody is going to admire his beauty, but, you know, people have, would be also planning, you know, thinking this, this ivory has values, he's, he's in a lot of danger. Uh, we are alerting the park authorities every time he does come out, but, uh, you know, there's more action needs to be taken, like I said, especially uh, a task of this magnitude, because uh, he's very young. He must be around uh, 18 to 20 years old. Uh, give him another 10 to 15 years and he would be one of the most impressive, impressive tuskers in Sri Lanka. Uh, but he needs to be protected. Uh, even inside the national park, he's under constant danger because of his ivory. And he's so well known in the, to the public. So it's a scary situation. And uh, uh, But if he does survive and if he does uh, grow to become... Uh, a big, uh, you know, tusker. Uh, he'd be one of the most impressive in the country because this this ivory, after he passes 30 years of age, would thicken and would lengthen further, and uh, you know, become very impressive. Uh, recent updates was that he has broken one the tips of his tusks, uh, so they are most curved inwards, uh, but not all the way like that. Uh, so, uh, but of course, nevertheless, bullet is a very impressive elephant. Uh, it is said that he uh, uh, he was a released elephant from the elephant transit home, uh, where the orphaned elephants are trained to be released back into the wild. Uh, so hence, he's quite used to people, but that can be to his detriment as well. 
then uh, moving on to the legendary and the mighty Sando. Uh, he's uh, by far, I would say, the most aggressive tusker that I have come across uh, and uh, the most feared tusker as well. Uh, when people know, uh, you know, talk about Sando, they all, you know, are wary of him and they, you know, you get a shudder because he's one tusker you don't want to fa come face to face with. He's very aggressive. Uh, he, he's the most dominant bull, I would say, in Yala. Uh, he comes in uh, when he's in must and he walks around like he owns the place and he has been known to attack most other elephants, males and most tuskers. And uh, he's a very, very aggressive bull uh, and has attacked many jeeps as well, many safari jeeps uh, in Yala. And also he's known to cross the border to Kumana as well and suddenly appears in Kumana and where he's been charging several vehicles as well. So he's a very, very aggressive bull. He's not very tall, but a very, very well-built, stocky elephant, as you can see. And the tusks are perfectly shaped to attack, uh, slightly curved upwards. And uh, one of the most impressive uh, elephants you would find in Yala, Yala National Park in the south of Sri Lanka. Uh, another uh, well-known bull in Yala is uh, Nalaka. Uh, Nalaka is a very old bull. I, I presume he's in his late 40s or maybe in his early 50s. Um, he's the tusker who I uh, showed uh, has a grass notch on his tusks and uh, he has upward curving tusks. So this is an easy way to identify him. He has upward curving tusks. When I last encountered him in 2017, I noticed there was like a sack or like a balloon on his leg. So it can be an infection or a cyst. Uh, but uh, he was seen uh, a year or two after that as well. So he seems to be alive uh, and uh, roaming around even now. Uh, but he's a very old bull and he might be on his way out. Uh, usually wild elephants would uh, you know, live uh, between 50 to 60 years old, but uh, uh, due to many natural causes, they can uh, succumb, succumb to uh, Ill several illnesses as they age. Uh, we can never, uh, when we talk about Yala, we can never miss uh, the most, one of the most famous tuskers in Yala and the most notorious, I would say. Uh, this is uh, Gamunu. Uh, so Mr. Gamunu, as a bad habit, has got used to being fed by some people and has a bad habit of putting his head into jeeps and demanding food. Uh, he's not an aggressive tusker by nature. He was a uh, young, uh, young elef uh, you know, elephant, uh, relatively young, uh, and people have re remember him as a young calf as well. Even I remember him as a young elephant when we were traveling in two year 2000. Uh, so he has grown over the years and become quite a notorious guy uh, uh, and uh, pretty well known. So uh, he he hijacks vehicles and demands food. So there are so many videos on YouTube. Uh, of him trying to, uh, you know, demand uh, uh, food. So it's, uh, and uh, the thing is, he, he, the, the the reason for this is that people have obviously, uh, maybe outside the parks have got him used to feeding uh, and eating. And he's not an aggressive elephant. You've not seen him in an aggressive way, but more, more as a, you know, almost like a beggar, you know, demanding all this uh, attention. Um, and he's a beautiful young tusker. Unfortunately, uh, he's been attacked by several bulls, possibly Sando and a few others. And uh, now he's lost both his tusks from the base itself. So uh, both his tusks are missing right now. And uh, it's un unfortunate. So, uh, but this is the story of one of the most famous elephants and tuskers in Yala. Uh, this is another old man of Yala who died a few years ago. This is Tilak. I like to call him Uncle Tilak because he was the oldest tusker during that time. Uh, you see, yeah, he was a very, uh, very calm elephant in the last few years. But when he was uh, young, he was quite aggressive. Uh, and uh, I, I was, in fact, uh, charged by this bull. Uh, in the later years, he, he grew some very impressive uh, sets of ivory. Uh, sadly, he, he succumbed to uh, old age and he was attacked several times by other elephant, other tuskers as well. And they were treating him uh, during the last years of his life. Uh, 
so but tilak is also a memorable tasker who i i i would still appreciate and remember uh, moving on to vilpattu um this is a tasker which is very very uh, you know was a very impressive tasker who and this is a photograph which is one of my favorites of all time uh this is a bull called mega and he was photographed several years ago he's a one of the most impressive tuskers in the park uh vilpattu as you know is a heavily forested densely wooded park and uh, seeing this guy uh, was a great privilege uh, he was you know, hidden right in the in the thick of it and uh, you know very, he was he's very shy by nature as well a lot of people have seen him even out in the open would say that he would run immediately as he as he spotted you he's very shy and a very secretive tasker and possibly the reason why he survived for so long uh, so in this case uh, we were waiting uh, slowly just quietly waiting uh, trying to hope that he would come out slowly he appeared uh, through the bushes and uh, and the sun was falling perfectly on his face as he was turning his side to have a look at us so this is the moment where i took uh, this photograph and uh, what i like about it is also the fact that he it shows the habitat of vilpattu as well because vilpattu is um, a very thickly densely forested park and it's dark and dense so it just depicts exactly what vilpattu is all about and just as a jeep another jeep was approaching he just ran into the wood into the uh, uh deep forest and uh, that was all we saw of him so he is a very impressive tasker and unfortunately uh this year a uh, few months several months ago uh, they found him uh, dying in the fields of borpan villa this is one of the areas he was hanging around mostly uh he seemed to have been attacked by another tasker because he had a wound on his neck and uh, despite the efforts by the wildlife department he succumbed to his injuries uh it's very sad to see but of course it's a natural occurrence so it's part of nature something we need to accept so mega mayor is actually a very impressive bull uh, and one of the most impressive i have ever seen and finally uh from the significant bulls i come to my favorite uh this is gajaba i would say is uh, my favorite tusker and uh i'd like to call him the king of all tuskers he's physically the biggest most uh, impressive uh, tusker i've ever seen uh, he's immense in size uh, he we estimate that he's around 10.2 feet at the shoulder uh, as you see he towers above the adult female so this is an adult female and you see he's uh, he's he towers above them and uh, he's found uh, in an area which is very risky he roam he has a huge home range uh, and he moves from place to place you you never see him in one place uh, for long um, and uh, you see he's physically a very very uh, impressive uh, impressive bull and uh, physically he's very muscular and he's very tall and he has very big thick tusks which keep growing and he has a very impressive head and dome as well so as you see uh, elephants who mature in age uh, you know start showing a very big head and big tusks and uh, these are signs that he is not only does he have superior genetics but he also uh, is well fed lot of nutrition uh, because unfortunately uh, it will be dangerous for him but they do raid a lot of crops and eat a lot of high nutrition food uh from a lot of the farmers so that is a maybe another reason why he's so well built and uh, it's always a pleasure to see him uh so i've encountered him about five to six times uh during you know in the last few years but of course finding him is uh very difficult and uh, i don't like to reveal the location but uh i have to say that most of the time that i go in search of him i come back empty handed because it's very difficult to see him and he's not very forward as well he's quite a shy elephant lately he's been uh, a little bit more uh, accustomed to people but about 7 8 years ago he was very shy and used to run away as soon as he uh, uh, caught a glimpse of people uh, 
and uh, I've come back many times empty-handed without seeing him. So it's always a pleasure to catch a glimpse of him. And uh, he's a very, very impressive task, especially when he's hanging around with the herd and see him walking around in full must. Uh, so we hope that he still continues to roam around uh, the country. And I do hope that uh, he's able to pass his genes on to the next generation. So the area that he's hanging around in has some of the highest densities of Tuskers. And most of the herd, uh, herd that he hangs around with, uh, most of the young ones are Tuskers, young males. So it's very impressive and very nice to see. Uh, but also it's very worrying as well because these are not national parks where they hang around in. And therefore uh, you don't, uh, we, we, are, we are quite worried uh, with the, uh, how long this would last and especially with the new changes in government policies and uh, things like that. These kind of other state forests can be gone for forever and the elephants would have nowhere to go. And um, this was a beautiful site I took um, of Gajaba uh, with a small herd. Uh, this is at a village tank, a village lake. Uh, on the other side, on this side, there were so many villagers just uh, having a bath in the lake after working and uh, we were just sitting on the bund of the lake and you know admiring this site. And uh, what's uh, what's nice to see is that you know they're just living right next to human habitat. And the people uh, in that instance were quite uh, impressed and they did not want to disturb them. But in most cases, uh, they are not welcome and uh, because they raid a lot of crops, so people don't welcome them. Uh, but of course, a lot of them when they see this big boy uh, get you know. Uh, really, uh, they are awestruck, and uh, they do tend to admire him. Uh, he did get into a bit of danger this time. He moved into an area which he's not used to, uh, and then there was a news that the uh, the authorities were going to relocate him somewhere uh, because there were there was some danger that people were targeting him, and the people were targeting him. And uh, but of course, relocation is not the answer. Uh, especially capturing there, there's a lot of danger in tranquilizing an elephant. Uh, you can, you know, uh, there are quite a big chance that you may not get up again. Uh, there's a lot of uh, danger when they're relocating that the accident can happen, uh, as you saw in the case of Parakrama. So it was uh, a lot of environmentalists and conservationists and um, people passionate about wildlife spoke up and stood up against it and protested. Um, and thankfully, he was not relocated and he's still in his home, uh, home range. Uh, but I don't know for how long. Uh, this is another uh, big guy in the same uh, similar herd that Kajaba is in. Uh, his name is Misaka. As you see, tusks come in very, very varied shapes and sizes. And as you can see, uh, this boy has very short tusks, but he's a big elephant. He's a quite a thick, big elephant. and. Uh, he tends to uh, bully some of the younger Tuskers when Gajaba is not around. And uh, quite a nice, uh, nice Tusker to have around and add some variation to this herd. That being said, uh, uh, those are some of the big mature bulls that uh, I have encountered. There's a lot more that we have seen, but of course uh, some, uh, you know, are not great photographs or not good evidence, uh, but of course, uh, uh, there's so many, uh, you know, uh, encounters which I would never forget. Uh, and uh, this is uh, a series of photographs of the next generation who are definitely going to be very impressive taskers if we can, uh, we can uh, protect them and protect their habitats. And uh, if the country as a whole uh, takes an initiative uh, to protect them. So this is a young bull uh, having a small tussle with an another elephant. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a beautiful uh, background as well with the lake uh, and the receding waters. Uh, this is the same herd with uh, where Gajaba is. Uh, the very big herd, as, as mentioned, there, were, there are a lot of young tuskers in this herd. And uh, there was about 100 elephants in this encounter. There were, this was in 2013. And uh, we were literally surrounded by a herd. And here in this photograph, it's a beautiful site where you see uh, one, two, and another one, three. So there are three young tuskers in one photograph, in one frame. Uh, this young guy would also definitely, you know, the ivory would start growing as he matures. 
So, you know, there's, it was quite heartening to see so many tuskers in one, one herd. Uh, this is another lake. Uh, this is the same lake where Walagamba and Neela and Digadantu are seen. Uh, this young tusker thought, you know, he's had enough with this elephant and he was giving him a push. So it's quite interesting and intriguing to watch the behavior of elephants and tuskers. Uh, just keeping a distance and just admiring them. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, you get some amazing moments of interactions between elephants. Uh, in this case, of course, uh, it's quite funny to see how this guy was pushing the elephant away. And the elephant was protesting, making a loud noise, as you see. Uh, that same bull along with another young uh, tusker, both, uh, you know, grazing together in the open grasslands of this lake. So quite a nice sight to see them facing the opposite directions. Uh, this is in Mineria, taken several years ago, a young, another young tusker uh, hanging around with the herd. Uh, most probably because he's still young, he must be uh, around with his, uh, with his mother and the female herd, but would move out very soon. Uh, but he's still a young bull, maybe around 15 years of age, 15 to say 18 years of age. Uh, this is also another task. Uh, you can see in this frame there are two, one, two, and there's another task somewhere here. So there are three taskers. He's the same herd as Gajaba, as, is, as I mentioned. Uh, quite a few taskers in this herd. Another young tusker seen walking around with another elephant. Uh, this is one of my favorite photographs and was actually the cover of my coffee table book, Children of Eden. Uh, two young taskers in a beautiful setting. Uh, same lake that uh, Walagamba used to roam and uh, beautiful background. Uh, it almost looks like Eden, uh, you know, like the Garden of Eden. It's a beautiful area, but for how long is the question? Because beyond this is all farmland. And for how long they would uh, have this area to roam around is a big question mark. And you see some beautiful interactions, as you see. Uh, this is a young bull which uh, we encountered uh, a few months ago uh, uh, in the same herd with Gajaba and Misaka. And uh, he was trying to approach some females and uh, Misaka, the guy with short tusks, uh, actually chased him away. And he was hanging around in the fringes until Misaka moved out so that he could interact. And the same herd, uh, we got very close to uh, a water hole where this really young tusker came to drink water and another young tusker as well. So um, pretty, uh, there's quite a lot of young tuskers around, uh, but of course, like I said, there's only around 7% of the total male elephant population who has ivory in Sri Lanka. And the way this is going, the way things are going, we will first lose the tuskers and maybe then lose the elephants as well uh, at this pace. So um, you have to stand up and, you know, uh, uh, you know, stand against all what is happening, but of course, uh, there are larger forces at play. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know how long this would last, but um, thank you so much. I've uh, tried to share my passion uh, and my enthusiasm for the taskers of Sri Lanka. And um, I hope that you all enjoyed this session. And uh, uh, I hope that I was able to pass on some inspiration for you to also take an active stand again in conservation uh, and uh, also be aware of what's really happening at the moment. Thank you so much. Uh, if there are any questions, um, I... Uh, yeah, uh, there are actually. So thank you, sir, for that extraordinary lecture. Uh, and also thank you everyone for sending the questions. We have a lot of questions, but I'm gonna try and put them together and, uh, and some of the more important ones. I think some of the questions you have already answered, sir. Uh, so one question a lot of people asked was, you know, how can we protect our tuskers? And a few people even suggested is sawing off tusks an option, like what they did in, uh, in Africa to the rhinos. Um, no. And, uh, yeah. I'll give you a quick answer for that, uh, yeah. Jonathan, and we'll go one by one. Yeah. Sawing off tusks is not an answer, and remember that uh, rhino's horns are made uh, out of. Uh, uh, it's a different. It's it's the same material uh, which um, it's made out of keratin. 
right? It's not ivory. Ivory are teeth. They are the incisors of the elephant, and therefore uh, you cannot saw them off, and it's not a solution. Sawing off tusks is not the solution. Like I said, the norm of any elephant should be to have tusks. That is a natural state. It, 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 this is how an elephant should be. Uh, mm. It's just that due to manipulation of humans over the years, we have come to a, a state where we have only 7% of tuskers. Uh, naturally, all males should have tusks, and sawing the tusks off is not the solution. The solution is to secure uh, proper uh, habitat uh, for the elephants, secured habitats linking the protected areas. The Department of Forest and the Department of Wildlife all separated with different jurisdictions. Connect these, connect the uh, protected areas, connect the elephant corridors, maybe acquire new land and connect them. Uh, mm. And, you know, uh, create proper habitats, sound habitats for the elephants, uh, where you, you know, uh, where it's a good, uh, you know, network that elephants can work around without arming people. And when it comes to people, uh, the one of the most underutilized assets uh, is the elephant. People, uh, a good example is Habarana. Uh, the town of Habarana survives on mainly tourism and a lot to do with elephant tourism. They do a lot of tourism in Minne when the elephant gathering occurs in Minneri and Kaudulla. Most of the hotels are booked, most of the guest houses are booked, most of the restaurants are full, uh, the jeeps are being utilized. So there's so much employment coming from um, the elephants. And there are so many other gatherings. I didn't mention any names of some of the places I showed. Uh, in the photographs, but there are so many lakes and open areas where elephants gather. If the communities, if the villagers and the people, the government gets together and you know creates opportunities for tourism, and you encourage the tour companies and uh, you know the travel companies to promote these areas, they will create a lot more income than you can imagine, and uh, you create employment. It's not you know not just. For, uh, uh, on the safari jeeps, but also about the the you know different uh, accommodations. Uh, you know you can look at you know providing so other services like food and meals. So many ways that you can actually uh, generate income through elephants, but it has to be done uh, sooner than later. So these are the ways that you can uh, you know encourage uh, to protect ele elephants in general. And talking about tuskers, because they are so rare, they can be marketed as, uh, you know, something really special, uh, you know, seeing tuskers and uh, uh, because they are a national treasure. And, and, and I, I would definitely uh, highly recommend some of the, the you know, the, most in, the biggest tuskers remaining to be, you know, declared national treasures and national monuments and given 24-7, 24-7 protection. Uh, if possible, because, uh, you know, uh, that is, it's it's only for a few, at least to protect them uh, while they live. A uh, famous example of uh, such big tuskers being protected uh, in Africa was uh, the case of Ahmed, uh, uh, the one of the biggest and most impressive tuskers in Kenya. Uh, he was given protection by the then president Jomo Kenyatta uh, until the last uh, days of his life. So I would say, uh, the, because of this situation, this is necessary, uh, especially for uh, uh, for the uh, really matured, uh, impressive, you know, alpha tuskers. If if that is if if we do have the res, you have enough resources to do that, mm -hmm. and it's something important if we are to preserve them. Yeah. So again, again, I think on those lines, uh, you were saying you were saying how we should like kind of monitor them and kind of follow them. So another person has asked, would GPS collaring elephants go a long way in their protection, especially in areas like uh, outside national parks, areas where human elephant conflict is the highest there. Uh, yeah, it's very strong, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you know, the thing is, uh, GPS alone is not enough unless you have armed rangers because having armed rangers is important, uh, you know, because, uh, okay, you have a GPS, you see where they're moving, but if there's no people to protect them and to monitor them and, uh, you know, even if they have a GPS, anyone can come and shoot them, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have armed rangers or, you know, people who are allocated to follow them and track them and keep an eye on them, that is the most important thing. Yeah.
uh, another question uh, that I think a few people had asked was, uh, you know, is there any way to recognize a mock charge over a real one? And what do you do during a mock charge or a charge in general? Like, what should you do if you're in a Jeep or on foot? Uh, I would not recommend you going on foot. Uh, you know, that's one thing I cannot uh, uh, responsibly recommend. So that's out of the picture. But uh, uh, if you if you do come on uh, come there come across them outside the park, of course there, there's no option. Uh, but the thing is to judge the elephant's behavior first and foremost. To avoid a charge, uh, one thing is uh, remember that elephants uh, rely a lot on smell. Uh, if they, if you are staying uh, downwind, they're definitely going to get your smell and know your your presence. So you have to be uh, not just sure if you're upwind. So if you're downwind, uh, you're not going to uh, be noticed too much. Uh, uh, elephant behavior, uh, you, as I said, uh, elephants who are very calm uh, will not, you know, will have their heads lowered. Uh, mm. Will be, you know, having, you know, tuskers might be, you know, having their uh, a trunk resting on the task and just, uh, you know, relax. Uh, so, you know, you, it's always important to judge their behavior. But if they do, you do encounter them all of a sudden and they do charge, uh, it's, uh, you know, most of the time it's going to be a mock charge, but uh, you, you can see that, you know, they're raising their heads and, you know, ears flared up and they're charging. But, uh, uh, sometimes if they do want to, you know, strike, they would be lowering their heads uh, most of the time. And uh, one thing I noticed is when they're really irritated, they um, they put the trunk in their mouth. Uh, and uh, that's another sign I noticed that they're really, really irritated. So, uh, of course, if they do really attack, if you're in the vehicle, uh, that's the safest place to be in. Uh, best is not to panic. Uh, make as much noise as possible start banging on the you know the the truck or the jeep you're in just make sure that you make as much noise as possible so that they move away uh most of the time uh if you stand your ground and you make a lot of noise they do move out yeah um next question is this is in uh male elephants in general uh how long do elephants go into mass do all male elephants go into mass at a certain period or does it happen invariably no, uh, different elephants uh, go into must uh, at different times. Uh, normally, uh, it's like two to three months in matured old bulls. And uh, basically, uh, some elephants come into must at certain some periods. So, like I said, for example, uh, in, in uh, the place where I you know, showed uh, Revata, uh, so Revata comes into must for a few months. Uh, and then, as he moves out, as he uh, goes out of must, Varna starts coming in. So, you know, like that, uh, several, some bulls come uh, into must at different periods. So, it's kind of possible to, like, I mean, you guys study them and stuff. Is it possible po possible to kind of calculate when he's going to go into must again? Must again? Generally, yes. Uh, generally, uh, a bull would normally, uh, you can predict uh, when he's coming based on, like, okay, this, these few months, uh, uh, what do you call... Uh, he would uh, be coming in and uh, usually the most dominant uh, come into must uh, in the best time of the year like you know where there's most females and uh, you know where you know they come into estrus mm. uh, for example uh, in like even in africa like you know one of the most famous tuskers was tim he used to come uh, into must during the rainy months uh, where there were a lot of elephants as well oh uh, yes uh, and one more question, you know, you were, I mean, you guys have identified so many elephants, I mean, so many tuskers. Uh, so one person has asked, how do you identify tuskers like after a certain while, say you see a tusker when he was small, when uh, as, a, as a calf, and then again, you see him again after so many years, uh, when he's a full grown adult, how are you going to identify him as to being that same tusker? Like, how do you identify them after a period of time? Well, one is the year shape. Uh, also, if you've been tracking him for many years, like if you see him to go out, you see him grow, so you know who it is uh, most of the time. But uh, otherwise, the ear, ear shape is one of the main uh, ways. And also uh, some unique features, like uh, even the tusks, uh, of course, you know, the relative shape uh, would, would be there throughout the years. But of course, as they fully mature, 
uh, things can change, the shape, the thickness can change. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it's also a guessing game as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, then also the tail, certain like, you know, scars, you know, uh, in the in the body, uh, things like that. Like some of the tails can get broken. So one of the, uh, the tail, the edge of the tail is broken in uh, some elephants. Uh, because other, you know, it, it can be uh, uh, the, that the, the, the other elephants can break it off, like, uh, for example, um, uh, or, you know, while they're, you know, uh, they accidentally step on it uh, while they're going up a hill or something. I don't know. It's just a theory. Uh, so these are the signs we look at. Yeah. And uh, just one, the final question, uh, like corridors and stuff like that, um, do they help in like, you know, for elephants, do they travel through those and go from like, say from one part of the country to the other part and they like can travel so that there is a diversity among the species of so the gene pool kinds of kind of uh, varies? Well, the elephants have their home ranges. They are not going to move out of an area they are not familiar with. And, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, you know, even if we link up the whole country, you know, we, ne we never know, you know, how, how long, how far they'll move out. Mm -hmm. But uh, because right now the, the habitats are scattered, but, uh, and they use these corridors and areas where they do cross uh, to other parts. Uh, unfortunately, most of these areas have been, again, uh, illegally, uh, unethically allocated to other purposes. Uh, I personally witnessed an area uh, where there was a uh, there was a uh, corridor where they used to uh, uh, cross from uh, cross a main road actually. Uh, and recently, that land has been leased out to a company to grow mangoes. No. So what really happened? The herd of elephants, uh, you know, went through someone's garden because he had you know went further ahead and went through somebody's garden. And uh, it was about, you know, we had to wait till about 6.30. We just, uh, you know, made sure that both sides of traffic were stopped. And we just said, you know, these elephants are about to cross. And as soon as it hit uh, darkness, uh, around 100, 150 elephants just crossed the road wow. right in front of us. But sad thing is that the area they used to hang cross from uh, has been used for mango cultivation for a big corporates. Main danger is that it's more than the small farm. It's also the big corporates and big business. And they don't, they just look at big agricultural projects and they don't realize that, you know, there are elephants in this area. Yeah. So would, would like, I guess, I think Singapore has done this where they have kind of like a flyover for animals to cross through where the road goes through a certain forest reserve. Uh, so would yeah, but Singapore mean, doesn't have elephants. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is that, can, can we, this thing that is Sri Lanka, can we put that in Sri Lanka? It should be done. Any 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 development should be uh, done sustainably. Sustainable development is the most important thing, and that's not what's happening in Sri Lanka. And that's the reason for all this problem. I got to remember that elephants are a flagship species, an umbrella species. If you protect the elephant, you protect the habitat. You protect all the other animals under it. Hmm. So true. Uh, so there are a lot more questions, but uh, unfortunately, due to the lack of time, we have to come to an end of okay. yet another very successful webinar. So we hope that you all learned something today and hope that this lecture motivated you to take a stand in protecting our iconic tuskers. This lecture was actually quite emotional to see that a large amount of these majestic tuskers are gone because of us humans. And because of us, there are only a handful left. If we continue to lose tuskers at this rate, it will only be a matter of time before they are no more. They are fate is in our hands and we must take a stand to protect them. Um, now, on behalf of the Wildlife Society of St. Thomas's College, Mount Lavinia, I would like to sincerely thank Mr. Rajiv Valikala for sharing his wealth of knowledge with us today. If not for people like Mr. Valikala, Sri Lanka's taskers would be in a far worse condition. He has spent an immense amount of time keeping track uh, on our tasker population and has also raised awareness and pushed for the conservation of our majestic taskers. I would also like to thank everyone who made this webinar possible and all of you who joined today. Uh, so we will be having our next webinar on the 16th of December from 6 p.m. onwards on the reptile diversity of Sri Lanka. So please stay tuned for more information. And uh, we will also make these webinars, uh, we have recorded them, so we will probably make them available so that you can watch it again uh, in the near future. So please uh, stay updated. We will update you guys. So thank you everyone for joining uh, and hope to see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.